I remember Captain Arthur Andrew Cipriani very well indeed. He was a friend of the underdog, a friend of everybody, and he did some remarkable things in his time. To give some example of what he did at the particular time, I would give you a story. There's a man called Goodin, an ordinary shoemaker from Belmont, who was honest in very many ways and, and did a lot of the church work and so. But he was a shoemaker. And Captain Cipriani encouraged him to stand for election. He was satisfied with his honesty, his good common sense, and his ability to get things done for the Northeastern Ward, which was Belmont. Goodin fought his election, and it was the first time that a shoemaker or a tradesman like that ever entered the Port of Spain City Council. Michael Hingson, who knew the captain and admired him. Women admired the captain. Daphne Pavan Taylor, who remembers the captain's visits to the home of her parents. They liked his courage, frankness, honesty. I recall two women who admired him very much. One was Audrey Jeffers, urban, involved in social welfare and in politics. The other was Maria Bermudez de Holla. She was a granddaughter of a Spanish governor of Trinidad, Martin de Saleveria. She owned and managed an estate in Cowra. And her argument with the captain was that he created labor problems on her estate, yet she respected him very much. Yes, indeed, Daphne. There were many sides to the captain. Michael Anthony, writer and researcher, currently writing a series of articles on the history of Port of Spain. I was very interested, as you should have mentioned, the granddaughter of Martin de Salaveria, because she said that he created labor problems. Well, this is exactly what the, the establishment was saying when Cipriani came on, on the scene. He had just come from the war in 1919, and the first thing he did was to take a good look around at the social situation. Now, he knew these returning ex-soldiers. This was the period when the ex-soldiers came back. And he thought that these people needed a leader. In fact, they knew him too. They loved and respected him. And they approached him, really. And he decided to air their grievances. And so he disturbed the peace by doing just this. Now, um, I must say at once that Cipriani was not only concerned with the labor scene in Trinidad. He was a staunch federationist, and he was, a, he was a great opponent of the Crown Colony system. Before the Labour Commonwealth Conference in 1928, we made the same claim that we again brought forward in 1930, namely, that the people of this colony have got the education, the ability, the civilization, and the necessary culture to administer their own affairs. Crown Colony rule might have been ideal 50 or 100 years ago. Crown Colony rule may still be ideal for the primitive races and for peoples just emerged from slavery, but it has outlived its usefulness in these colonies. Captain Cipriani was determined to have compulsory education introduced to Trinidad. And as a result, he consulted a scholarly friend of his about compulsory education. The scholar said, but Captain, what about those who don't want to be educated? There was no reply. Captain Cipriani replied soon afterwards in the Legislative Council. We are the representatives of the taxpayers. And if we come and tell the government that we want compulsory education introduced and are willing to foot the bill, may I ask why it is that government does not act upon that and introduce compulsory education in Trinidad. The abolition of child labor was introduced here some time ago. And I put it to you, it was only as a sop to Cipriani introducing an ordinance for the abolition of child labor. It was introduced, but our children are still being pilloried and sweated today, and the police know it and can do nothing. 
because they are helpless and fear to tackle those who are sweating the children. Introduce and enforce abolition of child labor and the compulsory education must follow. There was constant friction at that time between the government or the governor and the colonial secretary on the one side and Cipriani on the other. On one occasion he had cause to tell the colonial secretary of the day a few hard things and the question which they had been discussing at that time was the refusal of the steamship companies to carry Negroes as first class passengers. I do not see why the Honorable Colonial Secretary should try to tick me off in the manner he has. I would remind him that I'm not at school. I'm here representing the people. He on his side has his job to do. I do not object to this. My job is to represent the people and to speak on their behalf. And it is also part of my duty to warn Your Excellency against taking what I consider a false step. And when I make a recommendation to Your Excellency, I expect the government to take it in the spirit of sincerity in which it is meant. Yes, um, I would like to go back to 1919 because that seems to me to be the year that gave an idea of the shape of things to come. First of all, let us remember the social situation, the returning ex-soldiers who had not been treated like heroes by any stretch of the imagination. They were extremely bitter. In fact, the first batch arrived here in May of 1919, and by July, when there was a big Peace Day celebrations, we had one of the most awful riots in Port of Spain. People just seemed to, to um, respond to the bitterness that was all around them. And in downtown, particularly Duke Street, there were so many things happening there, so much danger to people and so on. I can't be sure what started this off, but it seems to me that the men were unemployed and they were reacting to this economic depression and their own state of, of affairs. And um, that's one big event, the Peace Day one. But perhaps the most significant thing about Captain Cipriani was that by December of that very year, 1919, he organized a waterfront strike, the first general strike in Port of Spain. And this also was a near riot because the waterfront firms really strenuously objected and did their best to quell it. Um, and it's very strange because Cipriani himself has always spoken against rioting. He seems to have a little abhorrence of it, as can be heard in several of his speeches. I know enough about riot acts not to make any foolish demonstration or to lead unarmed people against two or three machine guns which lie in your office. I'm sorry, but that isn't the Cipriani which I knew. I knew a peace-loving man, a man who was very helpful to everybody. And he always spoke about a peaceful evolution rather than a bloody revolution. I don't know if in later years, after those first riots, that he may have matured. But certainly when I knew him, there was nothing like that sort of speech making. He would say occasionally that he had his fingers tips on the pulse of everybody, and there he would um, leave it. It wasn't a question that he was trying to incite people to do anything wrong. In nearly every one of his speeches, he would tell them, my friends, go to your houses, do nothing wrong. And I don't think that we should gauge the Cipriani who became the leader of the West Indies, as it were, from those first early days. Yes, Michael, I'm a little bit surprised, though, that you spoke about his fiery speeches and that this wasn't the man you knew, because actually Cipriani was a very strange person. He could be very, very strong in council, and yet he could be very gentle sometimes, as Daphne pointed out. Um, for instance, one of the high points of his career was the fight for the takeover of the Trinidad Electric Company. He did some really uh, strange things there. He was very, very strong about this because the company's franchise had been up and they had no intention of giving this up. In fact, they asked for an extension of it. 
and Sipani decided that they could not have it. And he fought them tooth and nail. The matter went to the Privy Council three times. And in the end, of course, they had to give up. But the point is that during the fight for this, Cipriani pulled no punches at all. At one stage, in speaking to a crowd in Woodford Square, he told them that he was going to the transfer station and demand the handover of the company. I believe that this shows what a determined person he could be. And of course, he held his strong views. And after all, this is what has made him uh, the hero that he turned out to be. On Wednesday morning next, I am giving the time so that he will not be taken unawares. I will proceed to that office at 10 o'clock and ask him quite definitely whether he will accept the municipal check and government guarantees and hand over the undertaking to the municipality of Port of Spain on behalf of its ratepayers. If the answer is, as I expect it will be in the negative, then this party must get ready to take such steps as will force and compel the authorities of this country to take charge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do not propose to accept your good suggestions to dig up the rails, for this reason that I would hate to put my friends, the barefooted man, in danger of being arrested and imprisoned. I want the privilege to have all of that danger concentrated and centered on me alone. And if there is an arrest to be made, that arrest must be mine. That, my friends, is perfectly clear. And the issue is a perfect and honest one. We are willing to allow the Trinidad Electric Company to carry on under the police protection. I will later on discuss with my executive what those measures will be. But we are giving good, full, and frank notice to all concerned as to what will take place on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. I'm glad that you pointed out that he did take the case, or through his supporters, did take the case to the, the Privy Council. It simply shows that Cipriani was uh, constitutional in whatever he did. He respected law and order. And his way of speaking didn't matter whether he was speaking to the crowds in the street or whether he was speaking in the Legislative Council. It might be just as well if no finance committee sat at all. If that is the feeling with which the government is going to accept recommendations from the finance committee, then I suppose the sooner we shut down the finance committee and let the government run it, the better for all concerned. I won't waste any time to come here and be made a puppet of. When I give my advice, I expect it to be given full weight in the same way as I expect the advice of the government to be given the full weight to which it is entitled. Supriani was very concerned with public health and he sought the advice and opinions of the public health officers and obtained his facts and figures from them. The government know, it is no secret, the terrible toll taken of the labor classes by tuberculosis and ankylostomiasis in this colony. The government also know what are the remedial and preventive measures. But what have they done besides making their usual empty promises in the past, as they are willing to do in the future, and will make again this morning? The time was not very long ago when Sir Samuel Wilson was governor. I happened to discuss with him the necessity of erecting a sanatorium, and reminded him of the promise made by Sir John Chancellor that there would be no golf course on the St. James pasture until the sanatorium was erected. There has been no meeting of the Tuberculosis Association called since. The golf course exists, but the sanatorium has not yet been started and possibly never will, unless the people of this colony bring sufficient pressure on the government to make them realize what their responsibility is, not only to the classes, but to the masses of the laboring people of this colony. The percentage of ankylostomiasis in Cuba is 98% and possibly 100%. The, the government has done nothing. And why? Because it would mean bringing pressure to bear on the factory owners to put up modern and progressive latrine accommodation on their estates and to enable the laboring classes to live in houses fit for human inhabitation and not for the habitation of pigs. 
just before coming into the studio, I wrote this down. And I'm wondering how many people who see it can remember anything about it. These words were written in chalk on Captain Cipriani's auctioneer's office, and which was, of course, the office of the Trinidad Labour Party. And they meant government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Yeah, the little story behind this, I was curious to find out what it was. And it was Mr. Vivian Henry who gave me the history of it, that it, was, it formed part of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and that it was kept there, written there, particularly as a reminder that all those who came there should remember that this nation should not perish until government of the people, for the people, and by the people became a reality. Yes, Michael, there's a very interesting side to this because although Cipriani felt so fervently about uh, government for the people and by the people, yet there seemed to be something peculiar, not only to him, but to most of the great people of his era. Uh, we see it with Audrey Jeffers, we see it with Butler. These people had a very strong attachment to the British Empire. And Cipriani, although he spoke of self-government and federation, he always saw this goal as within the framework of the British Empire. I think the young people today will find this a sort of ambivalence. They can't understand it. But this was a characteristic of all these great people. And um, I am not sure what would have been the outcome of it if things had developed along that line. Because it does seem as though self-government self is in contradiction to the spirit of empire. But I think that um, his stand on self-government was very sincere, very strong. And despite the, the pronouncements about within the British Empire, I think it had a great deal of meaning as his speeches can show. I have an abiding faith in the barefoot man. And I feel quite sure that he will stand up to it when perhaps the others will flinch. Our policy is this. No federation without self-government and no self-government without adult franchise. And on that we stand or fall. I leave unto you a charge tonight. And it is in three words which I want you never to forget. Agitate, educate, confederate. It is our privilege to agitate as long as we do it constitutionally. And let no one bluff you. That is a right that cannot be taken away from you even if you are British subjects. Educate. Do not forget that it is the greatest asset of a people and you must make every effort to see that your children get the very best education possible. Then confederate. You cannot confederate unless you agitate and educate and lead your people to understand what confederation means and stands for. I want to leave this platform with these words ringing in your ears. Captain Supriani, who is one of our earliest federationists, in 1932 in Dominica, he attended a West Indian conference for federation. This conference was attended by representatives of most of the West Indian Islands. In a speech that is considered flamboyant and extravagant, Captain Cipriani stirred the West Indies and brought about a passion for the federal cause. And now I pull the curtain down on the final stages of this important and far-reaching meeting. And as I watch the West Indies take on her mantle of nationhood, and dip behind the horizon like some threatening storm cloud, only to rise again on the dawn of a new day. I look forward and see in letters of fire emblazoned, the West Indies must be West Indian. And through the dark and grim grey dawn, methinks I hear the whisper saying, West Indians, awake! 
Awake, West Indians. Victory, freedom, liberty is yours. And so we hear the words ringing in our ears. I am the champion of the barefoot man. Agitate, educate, and confederate. We look around us in Port of Spain and we see great monuments to this man, chief among them being the Dry River. He was very much involved with the paving of this river, which has contributed so much to the health of the people. He was also a very gentle person, as Mrs. P. Taylor has told you, and he was affectionately known as Tattoo. He made a very important contribution in that he was very much involved with the building up of the Trinidad Working Men's Association, which at one time had 98 sections in Trinidad and 13 in Tobago. There can be no doubt whatsoever that Captain Cipriani has made a tremendous contribution to the political history of Trinidad. <laughs> 